Good morning and welcome to Calvary Cork Online. We're so delighted to have you here with us today. And um, my name is Jody, and I'm just going to do our announcements for today. So just two announcements. Number one is that our children's ministry beacon um, online will be on Calvary Cork Life Facebook page on Thursday at 3 p.m. So that's with Brandon and Ernie and Andy and Tina and the whole gang. Um, Thursday at 3 p.m. So if you have kids, tune in. Um, it's always a great um, learning experience and lots of fun. And there, all the beacons are available for you to watch. There's more than 50 of them. So tune in anytime really to watch one of the older beacons with your kids if you're looking for things to do now with homeschool and everything. Um, and then our second announcement is that prayer meeting is starting back up again this week. So that's going to be at 7.30 um, and it's going to be on Zoom. So Wednesday at 7.30 on Zoom. And if you want to get the Zoom link to attend the prayer meeting, um, just email info at calvarycork.org. Um, yeah, so if you email info at calvarycork.org, you can get the Zoom link and attend um, the prayer meeting on Wednesday night at 7.30. So that's our announcements for today. Um, have a blessed Sunday and enjoy the service. And we're going to hand over now for the call to worship. Bye. Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to Online Calvary Cork. Uh, my name is Carlos, and I'm going to do the call to worship uh, this morning. If you're a regular attendee, uh, we miss you, and we're looking forward to see you soon, God willing. If you are a guest from any other part of the world uh, watching us online, we're very glad that you can join us. So, uh, call to worship. It's, I guess it's been a long time for everyone. And one of the things that has been happening to me and probably to you, we're only thinking about negative things and things that uncertainty, anxiety. And But I invite you today and this morning that you would focus your heart and your mind in God, in, in the gospel of Jesus, and that it will be a time of refreshal and renewal for you. So for the call to worship, I'm going to read Psalm 84, which says, uh, so Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your where, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also cover, covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your curse is, courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does, does he withhold. From those who walk uprightly, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. So in this morning, I would like to invite you to come to the dwelling place of the Lord of hosts, that you can have rest and peace in him. I, I would pray that your soul, as the psalmist say, longs for the course of the Lord. May you sing with joy to the living God. Uh, remember that you are blessed that you, are, you have a, a dwelling place in the house of your father, ever singing his praise. So we have a reason to rejoice. As the psalm is saying, uh, we, have, we have a reason to rejoice in God's salvation, in his love, his mercy. Uh, so I know uh, probably a lot of you have been going through very difficult times recently. Uh, probably even you're sick for whatever reason or family situation. But I pray that in this morning, your heart would rejoice and sing with, with joy and gladness to the Lord. So with that in mind, 
Uh, let's pray and then we can call to worship the Lord together in spirit. Father God, thank you so much for this morning that can, we can meet together even if it's virtually, Lord. I pray that today our hearts would rejoice and that we remember that we dwell in your house, Lord, all of our days of our life. I pray that our, our hearts would be filled with joy, with gladness, that we would put all of the things that are happening aside, Lord, and we would be fully focused on you, Lord. I pray for spiritual renewal this morning, that you would give us fresh spirits and fresh heart, Lord, to worship you, to hear from your word. And I pray for the worship team and the uh, the rest of the team, Lord, that it would be an honorable service to you, Lord. I pray for those who are lonely and feeling sick, Lord, in depression, anxiety. I pray that you would be with them this morning and the coming week, Lord. I also pray that a lot of people would hear your gospel and they would find the hope and, and gladness in you, Lord, because you are the source of our joy. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So with that in mind, uh, we go now with the worship uh, to the worship team. See you. Good morning, church. For those of you who don't know me, my own name is Emma, and I'm going to lead us in two songs of worship this morning. Yeah. 
God. <clears throat> Thank you for this time of worship, God. Thank you for your promise, God, that you will never leave us. You will never abandon us. God, times are so unpredictable at the moment, but we know that we can depend on you. There's one thing that isn't unpredictable, God, and that's your promises. Your promise that you will work all things for the good, Lord God. You will work everything out for our good. And Lord, we trust you and we love you. I pray that you would speak to each heart, every heart that's watching online this morning, God. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Welcome to another Kids Moment. I'm Brandon. Who has seen one of these before? Now, unless you've been living under a rock for the last year, I'm sure you're very familiar with a sign similar to that or that very sign right there. It's a sign that tells us that we have to stay two meters apart from people, stay distant, socially distant, not getting too close to anyone. And that actually leads us to today's word of the week. Today's word of the week is approach. And approach is a very simple word that means to come close or to come near to something or to someone. Jesus talks, talks about approaching him in a lot of different places in the Bible. He talks about it in the New Testament where he says, Come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's a story in the Bible where he talks to the disciples, and the disciples were trying to keep the kids away from him so that he could just talk to the adults. And Jesus says, Guys, don't do that. He reprimanded them. He said, Let the little children come unto me. He asked for them to approach him. Jesus is approachable. He not only makes it able for us to come close to him, he asks for us to come close to him. So today in Mr. Mike's message, I want you to pay attention to all the places that he says the word approach. Keep track of those. But in the meantime, I have a couple of tasks that I want for you to do. Kids, if you're paying attention and listening to the message right now, I want you to stand up nice and tall. I want you to draw close to a mom or dad or a brother or sister. I want you to approach them, to go close to them or get near to them. And I want you to wrap your arms around them and give them a great big hug. Now, it's not just for kids. Parents, adults, you guys can do this too. If you have someone else in the house with you, feel free to get up from where you're at and approach them and to give them a great big hug. You know, we're designed and built to approach one another, to be in close proximity with each other. And Jesus makes a perfect example of that where he not just makes it able for us to approach him, he also asks for us to approach him. So that's the first task that I want you to do is to stand up and give somebody a hug. Approach them, get close to them, and let them know how much you love and appreciate them. The second thing that I want you to do today is as Mr. Mike is going through his message, kids, I want you to draw a picture of how you can approach Jesus. You, you can draw a picture of how you can approach him or draw a picture of how you actually have approached Jesus. So those are the two things that I want you to do today. Stand up, give someone a hug, draw a picture of how you can approach Jesus or how you have approached Jesus. And then the third one, keep track of all the times that Mr. Mike says approach. That's our word of the week today. I hope that you'll be paying attention to Mr. Mike's message. I'm going to send it over to the scripture reading for right now. We'll see you guys again next week. Bye. Good morning, Calvary Cork. My name is Eileen Healy, um, and I will be reading the scriptures this morning. If you'd like to open up your Bible with me, um, over to John chapter 14, and I'll be reading verses 1 to 14. Um, but note that um, today's sermon will be focusing on the second half, which will be verses 8 to 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go, go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father 
and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Now we're going to go over to Mike for today's sermon. Hey, okay, well, thank you so much to um, Emma and the worship team. Uh, thank you so much to Eileen for uh, a reading of so many verses, uh, but you did great. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Brandon for uh, the word of the week. We're happy to have uh, the kids moment section back. And so, Here's kind of a, a big idea, not just for this Sunday's sermon, but I think this whole section of John's Gospel that we're in, 14, 15, 16, 17, these chapters are just like sacred ground. And here, Jesus explains to his disciples that he has an upcoming departure. He is going to be leaving them, but once he is physically gone, they're going to be able to approach him with more confidence and they're able to receive more and more of his equipping power. So that's the big idea of chapters 14 all the way to 17. Jesus gathers the disciples together in the upper room. It's maybe the equivalent of a sitting room, maybe that you're in right now. And he says, listen guys, I'm going, but you're going to be better off because I'm going. That kind of comes through last week. We looked at John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. If you didn't watch that, you've got to. Mark Payton did such a great job. Um, and uh, you, you've got to do that, okay? Jesus is letting them know that it's going to be okay. In fact, it's going to be better now that he's gone. So with that in mind, let's, let's approach God together in prayer uh, before we get started. So, Lord, in these like troubling times that we're in, I, I pray that we can take verse 1 of John 14 uh, deep into us. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. I'm faced with a choice between having our hearts be troubled or believing in you, I, I pray that we can, even this morning, extend our hearts, open our hearts to trust and believe in you more. Help us by your spirit to turn from anxiety and turn towards you. The God of peace, you are the God of all comfort. You're the God who was and who is and who is to come. You're the God who has revealed yourself to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to trust you even now this morning. We pray this in his name. Amen. All right, so here is the first thing that we should know about this passage. Um, here's, the, here's the first idea. Number one, you can approach Jesus with your biggest or your smallest request. And we're going to look at the first section there, uh, verses 7, 8, and 9. Um, you heard from Eileen's reading, and I hope that you have your Bibles open before you uh, in your lap, that Philip is going to ask Jesus a pretty big favor in this section. 
But before we get to Philip's big request, just remember all the different times that Jesus is approached by the disciples and by others with all these kinds of requests. Big requests. Small requests. Some of them are giant. Some of them are tiny. The disciples were quick to get Jesus involved in their problems. Um, can you remember, like, one of the times they say, Jesus, we're involved in kind of like an argument or a dispute among ourselves. Can, can you come in and can you mediate in this argument? Or another time they said, Jesus, could you just teach us how to pray? Um, or another time, they said, uh, Jesus, can you explain to us the signs that will precede the judgment of the world? So they ask these small things and these big things. And here's, here's an idea. He is surprisingly approachable by them. The disciples feel free to bring big requests and small requests to their rabbi, to their leader, Jesus of Nazareth. They're probably used to the idea, but we should be surprised at this. Um, when God the Father encoded his own son into human DNA, he did not make him look marvelous and impressive. Like Jesus was shockingly ordinary in his appearance. Uh, what I mean is he didn't glow in the dark. Um, he didn't have a halo. Um, he wasn't 10 foot tall. Like Jesus looked normal. You know, in a few chapters in John chapter 18, when Jesus will be arrested at night in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Judas had to arrange a signal so that the Roman guards would know who to arrest. He says, oh, listen, there's going to be kind of like a bunch of like, Jewish men, and they all kind of look the same. I'm going to tell you which one to arrest. He didn't say, oh, get the guy who glows in the dark. Uh, he didn't say, uh, get the only blonde-haired, blue-eyed man in all of Palestine. That's Jesus. <laughs> no, he didn't say any of that. He said, listen, Jesus looks like everybody else. I'm going to have to identify him. So what a reminder that the Son of God looked normal. But it's not just the appearance that I'm talking about. Uh, it is his, like, his character, the, the way that he carried himself. Uh, Jesus was loving and he was compassion, compassionate. He had this like gentle joyfulness to him. Uh, he didn't march around like some military general. Uh, he didn't act like some big wig CEO. Um, he doesn't have the swagger of like a UFC MMA champion. Yes, he was powerful. Yes, he was courageous, but he didn't strut around like maybe people think that a, a powerful or a person of his stature should have. You know that song that we sang around Christmas time? I love the line that says this, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. You know, Jesus was God veiled in flesh. And you know what? It was ordinary flesh. So when he says verses 6 and 7, uh, they might be a little bit surprised. And I'm going to read it to you from the NIV translation. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So they're like baffled at this idea what he just said, that if you know Jesus, you know God. Uh, and, and then Philip has his request. Remember what we're looking at right now? That the disciples are able to bring their small requests and their big requests before Jesus. He's that approachable. Well, Philip approaches Jesus with a question, 
And his question, his request is this. Could, could you show us God? Um, that's a big request, isn't it? The, um, we'll talk about that towards the end of the sermon. But Jesus is saying, his answer to him in verse 9 is this. Have I been with you so long and still you don't know me, Philip? Have I been with you so long and still you don't know me? Uh, it's been three years that Philip has followed Jesus, heard his teachings, observed his character, uh, listened to Jesus in John chapter 5 and John chapter 10 and elsewhere, like speak about how he is equal to the Father. And, and here, at like the Last Supper, he says to, to Jesus, okay, well, that's, that's fine. Um, but if you could just show us God, we'd be happy. Well, like I said, we'll talk about this in a, in a few moments. But I think that phrase, have I been with you so long and still you don't know me? I wonder if that has maybe special relevance to, to Cork. I wonder if there's special relevance to this verse to like the Republic of Ireland. Like Jesus has been with Ireland so long. Um, there has been like much of Jesus in the country of Ireland. Of course, let me be, be clear to say a lot of times it's like the outer vestiges of Jesus inspired religion. Or, or, or at the very least, the mention of his name. But I mean, since like the fifth century and, and onwards, the name of Jesus has been known and even revered in a religious sense in the country of Ireland, even in the city of Cork, you know, since the eighth century, you know, founded as this monastic learning center. I wonder what Jesus say to Cork, have, have I been with you so long, but still you don't know me? And that's, that's kind of a, a tragic and, and a sad thing. And I realize there's nuances and, and hopefully I'm not speaking too um, broad a brush uh, speaking about this. But, but I'll, I'll tell you this, the name of Jesus has been known and the outer vestiges of, of what it means to know him have been around for, for 1,500 years. Has he been with Ireland so long? And still, Ireland doesn't know him. That's kind of a national thing. Um, here's a more personal question. What about you? Uh, how long have you been with Jesus and, and still you don't, don't know him? Look at, again, look at how verse, uh, is it verse 9? Look at how verse 9, uh, it says this. It uses his name at the end. Do you still not know me, Philip? Uh, last week, we saw about how Thomas had a question, and, and Jesus answered Thomas's question, but he didn't say his name at the end. I think because maybe Thomas was asking kind of like a, like an, um, uh, how do we get to heaven type of question. And here, Philip is asking a question that very much has to do with Jesus's identity. He uses Philip's name at the end of his response because he wants to have this like personal response. Jesus knows Philip. Does Philip know Jesus. So of course, like, like I, like, let me like lean in, you know, like I, I have to say, like, do you know Jesus? Um, how long have you been around Jesus? How, how long have you been um, attending Calvary Cork? How long have you been in churches like ours, where the Bible is taught, where songs are sung, where prayers are offered? But would you say that you really know Jesus? Well, Philip has been with Jesus for three years. How long have you been around Jesus? How long have you been part of churches like this? Three years? 30 years? Three months? And do you know Jesus? Or I could say this, are you making progress in your relationship with him? Jesus has been with Philip 
or rather Philip has been with Jesus for three years and he still kind of barely knows him. I'm going to ask, ask you this, you know, Ireland is in lockdown 3.0. It's like there's the lockdown, there's the sequel, and then here's the end of the trilogy, Lord willing. And have you run out of shows to stream on Netflix yet? Are you watching the same shows again because you're just looking for things to do? Um, would you consider taking some time while you have the time to intentionally invest in knowing Jesus more? In opening your Bible and reading it for an extended period of time. Not to quickly read a devotional in the morning or to see the verse of the day through an app on your phone, but to read six, seven, eight chapters in one sitting. Or to read one chapter six, seven, eight times in a row. Uh, maybe it involves um, going for a walk and leaving your phone at home and honestly speaking from your heart to him saying, I want to know you more. I've been with you for like three years, maybe more, maybe less, but I want to know you. Maybe that's something that you can do. Or maybe it's going for a walk and taking your phone with you, listening to an audio Bible, listening to sermons or podcasts or an audio book, and, and learning more of God and his ways. Have you been with me so long and still you don't? know me. Now, guys, we're not going to end there. You know, we're going to see in this next section that Jesus has done so much to know you and be known by you. But I, I feel that it'd be remiss to not highlight that, to ask you that searching question, how long have you been with Jesus and do you know him? So during this conversation with Philip, like, I don't know, maybe you've heard that phrase, maybe you haven't, where like, I wonder if Jesus felt known by him. I wonder if he felt seen by him. Uh, have you had a conversation with like, oftentimes it's a relative, maybe a close relative or a distant relative, and you, you talk for a long time and you feel like they don't really even know you. I wonder if Jesus felt this way, speaking to Philip and the disciples here. But there's one thing, though, that Jesus does want Philip to know, and for you as well. He wants you to know this. God the Father approaches us through Jesus the Son. God the Father approaches us through Jesus the Son. Um, so throughout these chapters, like I said, 14, 15, 16, 17, the divinity of Jesus becomes clearer and clearer in the focus. When I say divinity of Jesus, I, I just mean he is equal with God. And in fact, it is right to say that he is not just the son of God. He is God, the son. Like, like look at what it says there in verse nine. Whoever has seen me has seen the father. Seeing Jesus, the son is seeing God the Father. This is what John starts out his gospel with. Now, I don't know if you remember all the way back when we started John chapter 1. It seems like several lifetimes ago, right? But here's what it says. I'm going to read it to you in the NIV and then also in the New Living Translation. Both of them are going to be up on the screen says this, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And then here it is in the New Living Translation. It says, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. So John says it in the very start of the book, and then here Jesus says it again towards the very end. 
in the presence of Jesus, we are in the presence of God. And just like how Moses himself was told to take his sandals off in the presence of God in the burning bush, I mean, now, like the disciples had their sandals taken off by God in human flesh, Jesus Christ, and he washed their feet. Uh, verse 11 speaks about this interconnectedness between the Father and the Son. And these verses and others helped early Christians formulate and agree upon such statements of faith like this one, like the Nicene Creed. It says this, We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and he was made man. Now, I love these helpful summaries that our older brothers and sisters in the faith uh, put together. The Nicene Creed uh, being one of them that summarizes what the Bible teaches about Jesus. And we agree with them because they agree with the Bible, speaking about the deity, the godness of Jesus Christ. And uh, I mentioned verse 11. Let me read it here. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. And Jesus says, well, hey, please take my word for it. But if you don't take my word for it, just consider the miracles that you have seen. The Gospel of John speaks about the signs that Jesus performs. Signs point towards something. The water into wine, healing the officer's son, uh, the disabled person by the pool who was healed, the, 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 the loaves of bread multiplied, uh, walking on water, giving sight to the blind, raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus is like, what else do I have to do to convince you, Philip? Um, so we, we see here that God has that, um, we see here that like, he is like, God is approaching us through Christ. And then thirdly, and finally, we see that we must approach God the Father through Jesus the Son. I'll say it again while it's still on the screen. We must approach God the Father through Jesus the Son. We come to verse 12, our last couple of verses here. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So we must approach God the Father through Jesus the Son. And in verse 12, he says, all this is happening, these great promises, they're happening because I am going to my Father. Now, when Jesus speaks about going to his Father, he doesn't just mean his eventual return to heaven, although that is the destination, but he's speaking about the entire weekend's worth of redemptive work that he is about to endure. He's speaking about the cross. He's speaking about his death. He's speaking about his burial. He's speaking about his glorious resurrection and then his ascension 
and his return to the Father. Because of that, things are going to get better afterwards. Remember, this whole section in the upper room, Jesus says, I am going away, but it's better for you. And here's some reasons why. Because Jesus goes to the cross, or I could say, because Jesus goes through the cross, we can pray to the Father with more confidence than ever. And here's two reasons why. Number one, we could pray to the Father with confidence because we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we who have trusted in Christ are forgiven and cleansed of all of our sins. Forever, finally, forgiven, freely, on behalf of his death on the cross. He died for our sins. He was punished for our sins so that we can come to the Father in prayer knowing that our sins are not separating us from God any longer. Here's another reason why it's better for them and for us. We have an advocate who loves us. John, in other books that he writes uh, in the New Testament, speaks about Jesus Christ as our advocate before the Father. When, when Jesus uh, walked on the earth, there was always this like long queue of people who wanted to talk to him. Crowds would gather and even press in. But now, the one who understands us best and loves us most has all power and is more approachable now than he was before. You'd have to wait, perhaps, to have an appointment or to make a request to Jesus during his time on earth. But now, we're able to approach God the Father through Jesus the Son. You're not at the end of the queue, you're at the front of the line because of his work at the cross, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension. He's gone to the cross, through the cross, to the Father, and now we have confident access to God because of the work of Jesus Christ, the Son. He is our advocate. That means that we have an ally in the highest position. It's a reminder to us that the entire Trinity is on your side, Christian. Uh, the Father, in love, initiated the plan of your salvation. The Son accomplished it at great cost to himself. The Spirit applies Christ's work to your heart and dwells with you. The Trinity is for you. And these verses, 12, 13, 14, I think they're some of like the greatest invitations to prayer in the entire Bible. Now, I think they can be misunderstood if people take them too woodenly, they can also, though, be neglected and ignored. So let's do neither. Let's not misunderstand these and press these verses to mean something that Jesus doesn't mean them to mean. But I think worse than that is to ignore them altogether. So let's do neither. Uh, let's take this invitation to prayer seriously and approach the Father through the Son. He invites us to come and pray. Jesus says to pray in his name. Now, this doesn't mean that we use the syllables Jesus' name as some kind of like magic abracadabra that we say at, at the end of a prayer that guarantees that we will get it. He's not under compulsion to do what we want nor what we ask if we merely mutter the syllables that make up the name of Jesus. And I'm gonna assume that you probably know that already. Those of you that have been Christians for any number of years or even months, uh, you know that there's not some power that we hold over God by muttering the name of Jesus or shouting the name of Jesus or saying it in the right type of intonation at the end of a prayer. That's not how it works. 
Praying in the name of Jesus means praying in line with the the character of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus, the, the will of Jesus. And guys, there is much more that could be said about this. And I'm going to say more about it this Wednesday night at 7.30 on our Zoom prayer meeting. So if you want to come along to the prayer meeting, I'm saying how Jesus is inviting you to prayer. I think I'd be remiss to not also invite you to prayer, to come to the prayer meeting, uh, 7.30, Wednesday night, on Zoom. If you want a, a link to it, you can just email info at calvarycork.org, and we'll send you the link so we can talk about this verse and then do this verse together. So we're to pray in line that the Father is glorified in the Son. Uh, look at verse 13. That says that is the purpose, the goal of answered prayer is that the Father be glorified. I like how Martin Luther kind of asks a rhetorical question and then answers it. He says this, What does it mean that the Father is to be glorified in the Son? Nothing else than this, that the Father is to be known and acknowledged as a merciful and compassionate Father who is not angry with us and does not want to condemn us to hell, but remits our sins and grants us all his grace for his son's sake. This is the true honor in which God is glorified. Thank you, Martin. I love how you put things sometimes. <laughs> um, and of course, the final, a final thing, uh, Jesus says that even greater works will, will take place. Now, that also is something that you have to put your thinking caps on uh, for a little bit, but I'm kind of at the end of, of the time for, for this sermon. But when it speaks about what has Jesus done, what are his works? Well, I listed out the seven miracles that John's gospel already describes, but more than that, the great work that Jesus does is he reconciles the world to God, that upon the cross he satisfies God's justice, that he defeats the devil, that he, he dies carrying away the sins of the world, that he rises defeating death forever. Are we supposed to do greater works than that? Are we supposed to, to top that or to beat that? Uh, my friend, I don't think that Jesus is saying that we're going to accomplish greater acts of redemption than he did. Uh, what I and what many, many, the vast majority of scholars and, and people of the church throughout the centuries, they agree this promise is quantitative, not qualitative. What it means is the good things that Jesus did in his life, the church is going to continue and take further and farther than he did in his life while he was living in a certain plot of land in the Middle East. So we're not going to be doing what he did better, but we're going to be taking it further and farther than he did. You know, Jesus had uh, 11 devoted disciples. And of course, there was a larger crowd of people that followed him, maybe 120 uh, that were present in Acts chapter 1, um, who were devoted to him. But immediately afterwards, the follower count for Jesus just multiplies again and again and again. So the greater works, I think, is not that we are redeeming in a different or better way, but that the redemption that Christ accomplished through the church, by the Spirit, is going farther and wider than ever before. All right, that's kind of the some of the things to explain. Um, as I conclude, I just want to give kind of uh, one, one final thought at the end. That's a preacher's trick. <laughs> you say, all right, we're going to conclude now, and then one, one final thing. But don't get up and make your tea just yet. Don't turn off the YouTube channel because I saved the best for last. Coming back to that 
question, that kind of like audacious question that Philip asked that started this whole paragraph. In verse 8, he says, you know, Jesus, would you just show us the Father and then, and then we'll be satisfied? Just note this. Those who are nearest to Jesus are the most willing to ask for like the simplest things and the most audacious things. Um, they feel comfortable like leaning in and asking for a big ask. As I think about Philip asking Jesus this, it reminds me of um, uh, like a week ago, uh, my family and I were visiting a, a relative and uh, it, it's a relative that my daughter hasn't grown up with and so she didn't know this person very well. And as we're in their sitting room or as we're, I think, standing near their kitchen, uh, my daughter Rosie, she kind of like, you know, whispers into my ear and says, you know, Dad, would it be okay if I ask them if I could have a cup of water? And Jesus doesn't want to have some kind of relationship with you or any of his people where we feel uncomfortable asking for small or great things. That's not how he is. There's no sense of apprehension in Philip, nor should there be a sense of apprehension in you. Jesus showed them over the past three years, and Jesus has shown his followers over the past 2,000 years that he is entirely approachable and welcoming. They understand that instinctively. Guys, there's a lot of things that Philip and the other disciples like don't understand about Jesus. And these, this conversation is going to just show how much they don't understand. But they understand something very important. And it's that he is approachable. They're able to bring their requests, the small and the big, to the approachable Christ. I wish that I could believe that as much as they did. I wish that you would believe this as much as they did, but it's true. He is that approachable. Um, Jesus does not look at you with disdain, but is moved in his heart with compassion towards you. He, he doesn't look at you with disappointment as you come before him in prayer to, to request something small or great. He doesn't have in his heart a feeling of begrudgery towards you. Okay, fine. No. The deepest heart of Jesus is actually gentle and lowly. That's how he described himself in Matthew 10, 28. Come, all who are burdened and heavy laden, come to me and learn of me because I am gentle and lowly of heart. Let yourself be convinced of the reality of the real Jesus and his accessibility to you. What Philip is asking here, like I said, it's a big ask. What Philip is asking is kind of reminiscent of what Moses asked of God in Exodus chapter 33. In fact, I wonder if Philip was actually kind of referencing or thinking about this verse as the question comes out of his lips. In Exodus 33, Moses asks God, God, would you show me your glory? And God says, I'm paraphrasing, he says, you know what? I can't show you all of my glory or else you would die. But here's what I'll do. I'm going to show you my goodness. I'm going to show you a little bit of my glory. And so he takes Moses and he kind of places him in the cleft of a rock, a place of safety. And then it says that, that God passes by him and it's the like the afterglow or it's the, 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 he sees the very trail end of the glory of God. But even seeing just like the wake of his glory, Moses is glowing. He's like irradiated 
with the presence of God. So why doesn't Jesus do that for Philip? Why doesn't he just say, hey, Philip, great question. Here, let me hide you in the cleft of this rock and and we'll see the glory of God. Well, because the Lord of glory is already standing right in front of Philip. Philip is already looking at the goodness of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Remember John 1, 14? Uh, we already read it, but it says that we beheld his glory. Philip is beholding the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so, Calvary Cork, in Christ, we see the goodness of God. And so, let's push in to knowing Christ, who has made himself known to us. Let's bring our requests, our small and our great requests, to him because he wants to be approached by us because he has first approached us. Let me close by quoting a hymn. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed with righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Please join me in prayer. So Father, we have overheard a conversation between an uninformed but comfortable disciple of Jesus who's able to ask small and great things of his Messiah. Here we are, Lord, uninformed, but yet comfortable. Help us to lean more and more into our identity as beloved sons and daughters. Help us to bring the small and the big to you. I pray that verse one would just echo in our hearts the invitation that Jesus gives us to not let our hearts be troubled but to trust in him. Father, we believe, help our unbelief, help us to believe more truly and fully into the Lord Jesus Christ. Move amongst my, my brothers and sisters in surprising ways. I pray that you as God made flesh would be real in our hearts that as we are assaulted as it were from all sides as our patience runs thin as our hearts are troubled I pray Lord that we would be seeing you afresh in ways that Philip could only dream of but work in us Work for us, work with us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing one final song. And, you know, a lot of times people might focus on those final verses about the, the great works that we, we should be doing or that we can do. But our final song, we're just going to sing together or meditate on these words together Great are you, Lord. Yes, we're able, and I hope that we're able to do great works, but we also serve chiefly, foremostly, a great God. So let's, let's consider the greatness of our Lord. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to finish up with one more song.
Great.
Yes, Lord God, we pour out all of our praise to you this morning, God. You're worthy of all of our praise, God. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that through you, through the Father, that you have, we, you have enabled us, Lord, to do greater things. You have called us to do greater things. And I pray now that you will bless the rest of our day, bless the rest of our Sunday, the rest, bless the rest of this week, Lord. Um, we give you all of the praise, all the honour, all the thanks this morning, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, and I'm just going to read out our benediction. I'm going to read out from Numbers. From Numbers 6, um, verse 22. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So... Yeah, thanks for tuning in and hopefully I'll see you again soon. God bless.